thank you for being here. I know it's you're all busy and it's warm. It's hard to be here, but we really appreciate it. And I feel like women's health is so important because women are powerful. When a woman feels healthy and strong physically, emotionally, spiritually, the whole world is better. I'm talking about the relationships are better with spouses. Children are actually more empowered to face junior high or whatever ordeals they have in life. Um, our communities are stronger, so truly the whole world is a better place when women are healthy and strong. So I'm going to have, I'm going to pass out some index cards. So in case you guys, in case you can do this for me when it comes back, um, in case you have questions, please jot them down because we're going to go through our schedule for you and we want to be able to answer your questions. So at the end of this uh, presentation, then you'll have a chance to ask whatever questions you have. And as we begin, so life expectancy in the United States actually has gone down the past two years, which is kind of an interesting trend. Now it's actually 78.6 compared to being a little bit older. And they're attributing that to actually despair. So they're talking about abuse of medications and just being depressed, things like that. So that's kind of a sad thing. But who knows why or what is the number one killer of women in the United States? Anybody know? Heart disease, yes. So heart disease or cardiovascular disease. We used to think of it as a man's disease, but we're learning that that's a very important thing for women too. Um, so there are some things that we're going to talk about a little bit in here that will help us to be healthier and strong and make our hearts and cardiovascular uh, systems stronger. And who knows? So there's our first one, heart disease. Who knows what is the second greatest cause of death in the United States for women? Guesses? You can probably guess. It's the C word. Yes, cancer. So number two killer of women in the United States. So specifically, we're talking lung cancer. And actually, two out of 10 people that have lung cancer have never smoked. So it's not just for smokers. It's also breast cancer, which is why we do screening for breast cancers starting at a younger age, and then also colorectal cancer. So that's the number two cause. And then another thing that isn't necessarily a top cause of death, but it's really a top cause of decreased quality of life, and you probably can guess this too, and I'm talking about diabetes. And there are lots of lifestyle things that we can do to improve our chances of not getting diabetes, or even if we do have it, the lifestyle choices that you make when you're younger or even if you get diagnosed when you're 60 or 80, there are some things that you can do to improve that too. Because diabetes is definitely an effector on quality of life. So it can affect the small vessels. So we're talking about cardiovascular disease again. So we're talking about vessels, heart. It affects the kidneys. It affects uh, nerves. So sometimes people have pain in their feet or other complications because of that. And it definitely affects the eyes. So. That's why people that have some of these conditions or risk factors for these, that's why we want to see you more often in the clinic so that we can kind of be on top of these things. All right, so other things. As we get into this, and I forgot to outline what our plan is, I'm going to talk about just general women's health care stuff. And then Dr. Ludlow, my mentor and friend, he gets to talk about hormones. So any questions you have about hormones, he's the expert on that. And then at the end, we'll have some questions and answers and kind of go over whatever things you guys want to discuss. So as we talk about improving our quality and quantity of life, huge. Weight control is a huge one every single day in the clinic. I hear women who come in and they're my age, so I'm perimenopausal age, um, and women say they're really despairing, like, I don't know what's wrong, but I'm not doing anything different, but I keep gaining weight. That is part of the issue, is that you can't keep doing what you are doing and not expect to gain weight. Your body is changing. So the point is to teach women how to adapt to their changing body so that they can feel healthy and strong and at least maintain weight because that is a huge factor in heart disease and even in many cancers and definitely in diabetes. So maintaining weight, and I understand that is not an easy formula. Everybody wants that magic pill and it's not easy that way, but the effort that you put into it, you get tenfold back in return. So it's definitely worth it. If I can just mention, there was a really interesting study that looked at marathon runners. So these are people who run a large quantity every week. And as they aged, they all gained about 10 pounds per decade, even though they continued to exercise six and eight hours a, a, uh, six, eight hours a week. So 
as you talked about, weight gain is without changing something. And they, they were eating the same amount too, and that was the problem. As their metabolism slowed down, even though they exercised the same, they ran a lot, they gained weight. And I can't speak for men, but I can speak for women, that weight gain really affects our mental psyche. It affects our, um, how confident we feel. It affects our desire to be intimate. I mean, like it affects lots of things. So even though you might not look the same or weigh the same as you did when you're 25, you can still be really healthy and strong and just grow into your different body um, as we age. So being on top of this, like I said, I know it is not easy, but it is totally worth it. So another thing is regular exercise. I want you to do something for me. So as you're sitting there, uh, just fold your arms like this. So as you fold your arms, who has their right arm on top? I do. Am I the only one? Oh, Casey does. Everybody else has their left arm. OK, so do it the other way. It's kind of hard to do, right? My point in telling you that is some of us have some really good, strong health habits established. And some of us maybe don't have some really good health habits established. It's kind of like this. You kind of get used to doing the same thing over and over again. And if those are good, strong, healthy habits, then keep doing it. But sometimes we need to look at our life and kind of mix it up and change it. So regular exercise is one of those things that you almost have to think about switching the arm. How am I going to get up and exercise? What am I going to do? How am I going to adjust as my knees give out or my hip hurts too much or my heart isn't as strong as it used to be, so is it better for me to do one certain exercise versus another? But the consistency is huge. And heart disease doesn't start when you're 15. I mean, when you're, when you're 50. It actually starts when you're 15. So the habits that you create in your own lives or in the lives of your children, grandchildren, makes a big difference. So what you do when you're 20 makes a big difference when you're 40, which makes a big difference when you're 60. But it's never too late to start. And that's what I want you to know. My general rule for women is, you know, around age 40-ish, if you're planning to start a, an exercise program and you haven't been doing things before, it's a really good idea. Go talk to your healthcare provider and just say, all right, I have this knee issue or I just, you know, I have this strong family history of heart disease. I just want to make sure that everything's okay. Go talk to them so that you have the green light to go. And then that way you can kind of be aware of what are the potential things that might be red flags that you need to address. So change, change it up. Do something that's good for you. I still can't do it. I still keep doing the wrong arm on top. It's hard for some of us. For some of us, it's a little bit easier, but it makes a big difference. OK. And the other thing um, is healthy nutrition. Again, very easy to say and very hard to do. When I was younger, and some of you might remember this, like there were, I don't know, five different kinds of crackers at the grocery store. And now there's how many? Like two full aisles, right? There is an abundance of food. And the food industry is very smart and creative. And they've figured out ways to get food to us very quickly and easily. And they make it look good and sound good and make you feel good, so they think. But, and I'm not blaming it on them. I'm just saying we have to be more thoughtful about nutrition. And what we learned when we were younger is certainly different now. And some of the kids are getting this in school now, thinking, learning about nutrition. But you're probably going to have to relearn some of the concepts that you knew before. So in general, it should be lots of vegetables. You need to have fruits, lean sources of protein, some healthy fats. As far as carbohydrates or as far as breads go, you could actually do without. I know if you're going to eat breads and that's your favorite thing is pasta or your muffins or whatever, whole grains are definitely better. But how do you think we make cow's fat? We give them the whole grain, right? So just be thoughtful about those things. I'm not telling you no foods and never food. But I'm just saying, eat on purpose. And then that way, you can feel good about what you put into your body. Calcium is huge. Again, it really matters, particularly if you have young kids, because you build bones up until about age 25, maybe age 30 if you're lucky. So if people have lactose intolerance, um, if you have kids or grandkids that don't drink milk, they hate it. Those are the ones that we really want to get calcium in. So as they're developing and forming these bones, they're nice and strong. And then it really matters again, women, once we hit menopause, 50, 52, something like that, that's when bone density can start to nosedive. So if you don't like milk or you're lactose intolerant or you don't want the calories, because again, we talked about weight, right, when we get to be 45, 50, um, then that's fine. But if you're cutting out a whole food category, you need to find ways to replenish those nutrients. So 
if you're not getting it naturally, then look for some safe source of calcium in your diet. Effective stress management. We talk about this all the time in our life is stress. We, I swear the world spins faster now than it used to. Do you agree? When my kids who are like, you know, 12 are like, mom, it seems like we just had Christmas. That means something, because didn't Christmas take forever to come when you were little? So learning how to manage stress, and there are lots of ways to do it, and if you feel like, man, I'm sinking, then get some help, whether it's a book, whether it's a therapist, whether you have a good friend, but learn how to calm yourself down, because those hormones that are released when you're stressed are not necessarily good for weight, good for your heart, to heart. it's not good for your body, plus the quality of life definitely goes down when we're all stressed and high strung. And then adequate rest. This is another big thing. We're talking to an obstetrician here. So talk about adequate rest. He probably doesn't get it, but he keeps trying, I'm sure. <laughs> I've never seen him like this on his desk, but he probably wants to. But rest is vital. I mean, that is the time that we heal and repair and our bodies become healthier and stronger. So getting adequate rest. A lot of times, too, as we get a little bit older, our sleep patterns change. Again, perimenopause and menopause is a big time for this because of hot flashes or just because our sleep patterns have changed. So the more consistent you can be with your bedtime routine, you go to bed at the same time, you wake up at the same time, it doesn't matter if it's a holiday or weekend. Um, avoid stimulants, avoid blue lights before you go to bed, um, keep your room cool. There are lots of little things that you can be doing. Another big thing is the bedroom should be for Intimacy and sleep, that's it. So don't be watching TV, reading in bed. Those things sometimes cloud your brain. So if you can train your brain, when I go to my bedroom, this is what I do, I go to bed, then that is a helpful thing as we age and get older. And I don't want you just to survive, but I want women to thrive, because I already told you, women make the world a better place. So I'm counting on you to make the world a better place. All right, as we get into this, and I'm gonna turn the time over to Dr. Ludlow in just a second, but I'm gonna show you a few things. Maybe this looks like just an orchard to you, right? And you probably look at that and go, what the heck is that? Does it look like a little microbe or something? You might miss the joy in the fun of the picture if I only give you a piece of it, right? So here's another one. Hippos, if you just saw this piece of the puzzle, you might not know <laughs> that they're one of the most dangerous animals in the world because of that power that they have in these Teeth, and especially because they hide in the water lots of times. And if anyone's a biker in here, yes, that's good. Did you know that the Tour de France has a hidden biker in it? Do you see it? The cyclist is right here, and you may not even, you might miss it if you don't know. Okay, next one. What do you see in this? Chocolate? You saw it, which is good. I've looked at this so many times. Do you see the bear? Yeah, so for years I just thought it was a chocolate bar. <laughs> and there's a bear in there because it represents Bern, which is the capital of Switzerland, which is where Toleron was found, right? Now you know the story. And if you look at this, you might think you're gonna go hiking out in the woods and it's just gonna be a nice, peaceful, lonely, serene place. Did you know only 100 feet from where that picture was taken, there is a cabin hiding. Want me to show you again, do you see it? And this cabin is organized for emergency preparedness stuff and has all sorts of things in the walls and all set up for an emergency. And then last one, this just looks like a man building a house, right? Doing some work outside. But if I only gave you that one piece of the puzzle, you wouldn't appreciate the synchronous harmonization, the coordination that goes into that. So that's this little man right up here. <laughs> My point is, Sometimes we don't have all the pieces of the puzzle, or we think we know it, but maybe we don't know it, and we don't appreciate how everything fits together. And women are like that, particularly when we talk about hormones. There are a lot of intricate things, so our goal today is to educate you so that you can make great health decisions for yourself, and then you know when to worry about something, when to talk about something, how you can improve your own health. So, Dr. Ledlow is going to go next. So that was the fun part. Now we get down to the work part. So I'll, we're gonna talk about hormones and how that changes and how that affects our periods. And so some of us are still of the age we're having periods, some of us are not at the age we're having periods, but we know somebody who is. And so this is some information that has to do with bleeding. First, 
just definitions. Vaginal bleeding is any blood coming from the vagina, but as we see later on, that's different than menses. Menarche is the age at which we have our first period, and that's the spread if it's before 8 or after 15 or starting to be abnormal. Menstruation are regular periods due to ovulation. And a lot of women will call any vaginal bleeding their period, but it's really the ones that come due to ovulation. And then anovulatory, an being our word that means not. So that's bleeding that comes in the absence when we're not ovulating. And that's usually irregular bleeding that's irregular in timing, duration, and volume. So let's just talk for a minute why we have regular cycles. And it's not that important to remember the details of what I say, but it's what we're trying to get across is the delicate way in which the periods are controlled inside our body. Okay. Ovulation usually begins, uh, like I said, between somewhere between that 8 and uh, 15. Most young ladies have anovulatory bleeding for two or three years before they start to ovulate. We don't think it's late until about 22. So you can have irregular periods naturally until about 22. Then we expect things should take over. This just lists some of the pubal, pubal change that occur in females. These are things that we know well. So this is the picture that there'll be a test afterward that you'll have to get all the arrows correctly on how things work. But these are the parts of our body that control ovulation. Up in our brain, we have the hypothalamus, which is right in this area of the brain. Right below it is the pituitary gland. Then they go down to the ovaries. These are hormones. This is called gonadotropin-releasing hormone. That goes from the hypothalamus down to the pituitary. It's a stimulatory hormone. The pituitary makes lutein, uh, follicle-stimulating hormone. That's a stimulation hormone to the ovaries. The ovaries then make estrogen that go back and both initially positively uh, stimulate the pituitary to make more of the FSH, but then eventually it suppresses the FSH so that only one egg is ovulated per cycle. And again, it's not important to remember this, but just remember there's a, a hypothalamic, which is part of the brain, a pituitary, which is a gland in the base of your brain, not part of the brain, but next to it, and the ovaries, and they talk both positively and negatively to each other. So it's a very delicate balance that gets us to ovulate. This is another one of the same as the little egg follicle starts to grow and make more estrogen that initially goes back and positively stimulates the pituitary, but then as the estrogen gets to be higher, it actually inhibits the pituitary making that follicle stimulating hormone. So anything that gets in the way of that. These are our hormones if we were to measure them several times a day throughout a normal menstrual cycle. This is estrogen. So estrogen is dominant during what we call the secretory, I mean the proliferative phase as the endometrium is proliferating, getting thicker inside the uterus. Then it starts to drop off, becomes quite low, this is ovulation, and after ovulation, progesterone is made. So a lot of women think that the hormones are balancing against each other, but there is really no balance here. One is going up while the other is coming down, and they're moving in opposite directions. This causes the endometrium, the inner lining of the uterus, to grow thick. This one causes it to mature and prepare for implantation of an egg if you get pregnant. Then if you don't get pregnant, it drops off, you have your period, and it starts all over again. So follicle-stimulating hormone is, again, high in the beginning as it stimulates that follicle. There's a little surge at the time of ovulation, then it's quite low. And luteinizing hormone is a big surge at the time of ovulation. This is the hormone that's tested 
when you do those ovulation prediction kits. This is the one that predicts that ovulation. So again, the important thing to remember is that there's not one versus another. They wax and wane throughout the whole of the normal menstrual cycle. This is just a picture of what's happening in the endometrium inside the uterus and in the ovary based on where you are in the cycle. As the egg starts to grow, ovulation occurs. Then every woman forms a little cyst in her ovary called the corpus luteum. So having cyst in normal ovulation ovaries is normal. And here's the endometrium growing thick, ready for implantation if you get pregnant. Then if you don't get pregnant, it dies, sloughs off, and starts the whole process again. Why is it that we don't ovulate? Because there are many women who don't ovulate. There are many women who have that irregular bleeding. So these are the causes more or less in order of commonality. The most common reason is this polycystic ovary syndrome. And many women have heard of that. And we'll talk more about that because that's the one that affects our health that Kristen was talking about before. Of course, as we get closer to menopause, it becomes generally irregular. So that's very common in our 45 plus. Thyroid disease, either too much or too little thyroid is a common reason. And then physical and psychological stress we don't always talk about. So when the woman comes in to seize me and say, my periods have been irregular for the past six months. And I say, what's been going on? And she said, well, I had, uh, I had uh, my appendix out. Then uh, two months later, I had my gallbladder out. And then I ended up breaking my leg. And all of that stress, both physical and psychological stress, inhibits. Because the body says, if I've got to give up something when I'm in stress, the one thing I can give up is ovulation. Because it's not good to be pregnant when I'm already having these stressful events. This is another common one, particularly in our younger girls, our high school girls who are athletes or dancers who are working really hard to lose weight and they're exercising five and six hours a day. It's very common for that woman, that young woman, not to ovulate. And then certain medications can do it. And then finally, this is a pituitary. We talked about the pituitary gland. that They can have tumors. These are not cancerous tumors, benign tumors that can get in the way. But we want to evaluate the woman for all of these. And sometimes it's easy to say, well, you've got this. But particularly, particularly these pituitary tumors, they can grow large enough to put pressure on our optic nerve. And then we start to go blind. And we've been fussing with our periods. And in the meantime, we lost our sight because we didn't realize what was the cause. So these are just things we do. It's not really important that we talk to the, the lady, get her history, and find out about stressful events. And, do some laboratory tests looking for those abnormalities. A lot of people do hormone testing to see if my hormones are normal. As you can see from this graph, this is just the estrogen. There's an upper limit, a lower limit, and an average. And depending on where I am in my cycle, that average estrogen level varies quite a bit. So if you don't know where you are in the cycle, it's not helpful. Also, it's very difficult when a normal has that big of a range, 15 to 350. That's a 20-fold difference. And so what's normal for one woman at, say, 175 might be low for another woman who should be 250. But they all test within that normal range. The same is true with progesterone, 15 to 70. Again, that's a fourfold difference. And so it's very hard. The progesterone uh, levels would have been just like this, except shifted a little bit to the right. Other hormones that affect it, thyroid hormone, that is more steady. So those are the, that's the one that we, this is just showing again where in a pituitary. So it turns out that FSH, that, that hormone is very closely related to thyroid stimulating hormone. 
So if your thyroid's not working right and you've got too much thyroid stimulating hormone, your body can't tell the difference too well. And so it, thyroid abnormalities affect our ovaries because it affects FSH. Turns out we use the same, just as an aside, because all of this was worked out in women, the same hormone is present in men, even though men do not have follicles in their testes, but it's still the same hormone that stimulates testicular function. And because it was figured out in women first, we use follicle stimulating hormone in men, even though they don't have follicles to stimulate, it's the same hormone. So at least once the women got top billing there. And, okay. So let's talk about PCOS, because this is the one, and then we'll probably end with this. This is the commonest, most common cause for irregular cycles, and this is the one that has implications to what Kristen was talking about. So this is sort of things that you can look for to think, do I have polycystic ovary syndrome? Irregular menstrual cycle, that's a requirement to call it that. Excessive hair growth weight gain, dark skin on fold areas, that's in your neck and under your arms and under your breast, acne that is getting worse and unusual, and then on ultrasound finding of certain lot of cysts in your ovaries, giving it the name polycystic ovary. So women with any combination, two or three of these, we have to be concerned about them having that polycystic ovary syndrome. Very, very common. Here it says 10%. In certain populations, it might be higher than 10% of women. And when you talk about a disease, 10% is a very high number for any single disease. Number one cause of infertility. Very common cause of uterine cancer. And increases the risk of diabetes, high blood pressure, blood pressure high cholesterol. The higher level of androgens, that's another word for testosterone precursors explains some of the, these problems, explains the weight gain, explains the hair. And most important to think about is PCOS is treatable. This is another one that I don't want you to focus on too much, but I want you to look at obesity and see these arrows. Polycystic ovary syndrome causes obesity, and so the arrow goes that way, and obesity causes the problems of polycystic ovary. So it goes both ways. Obesity causes the problem, and that's one reason why PCOS is becoming increasingly common in the United States, is because of our weight is increasing. And then polycystic ovary disease leads to obesity. So you get this cycle that's very difficult to break. Women with PCOS have gained weight to start with, and then PCOS makes it hard for them to lose weight because PCOS increases androgens. That's a testosterone precursor. And there's a reason why weightlifters take testosterone because they want to bulk up. Well, if, you, if that woman has more androgens, her body's going to try and bulk up. And since she's not going to get taller, she can only get broader. And so, it's a, so that's really the one thing I want you to look at. It goes both ways. Obesity causes, and PCOS then causes obesity. And I don't think we need to look at that. This is a, just another one where in this slide it says PCOS syndrome starts here. And that's not 100% true. As I look at my practice, probably 90% of my patients with polycystic ovary syndrome are overweight, but 10% are not. So it's not a requirement to make the diagnosis. It's just very common. Okay. So, how do we treat polycystic ovary syndrome? How are we going to decrease our androgens so that we can then lose weight and won't have diabetes and won't have high blood pressure? There's a re reason men die before women, and that number one reason is testosterone. Testosterone is not a helpful hormone after we get to be about 60. Maybe when we're young and we're trying to kill the, the bad wolf and do our farming, it's a, a wonderful hormone. But after about age 60, it's not a kind hormone to us. So 
it's interesting that even moderate weight loss, you can be 50 pounds overweight, and if you lose even five or eight pounds, your ovaries will start functioning again, your androgens will start to drop, and those symptoms start to go away. Not always, but often. Certainly, if you can lose down to a, a more normal weight, it will help. Birth control pills are very helpful. A lot of women think, oh, if I take a birth control pill, I'm going to gain weight. But with PCOS, if we give a birth control pill, that turns off the ovaries because the birth control pill makes the body think, well, I'm already pregnant, so I don't need to do ovarian stuff. So as the ovaries turn off, the androgens go down, and it becomes easier to lose weight. So birth control pills are very helpful. They also give you regular periods. Because it's related to diabetes, insulin sensitizers like metformin, which is a very common type 2 diabetic medicine, also help. And then medicines for specific problems that it's causing, like acne, you'd use an anti-acne medicine, hair growth, you might use an anti-hair growth medi medication. But in all of these, these two are the most important because they affect all the different aspects of that PCOS. The reason that the woman came to see me was periods, and it helps that, but it also helps her later on with her diabetes, her high blood pressure, and her high cholesterol that she might not be worrying about when she's 28 and coming to see me. But as I found out, eventually 28 turns into 38, 48, 68. It just goes along. And what you didn't worry about when you're in your 20s, as Kristen was talking about, can come back to haunt you as you get to be a little bit older in life. Polycystic ovary also causes hair growth, but a lot of people don't understand hair very well. So first we have vellus hair and we have terminal hair. Men have more terminal hair on their face than women, but if you look microscopically, a woman has every bit as much hair on her cheek as a man does. It's just that fine vellus hair that you can't see. But every day that you're alive, if you're a woman, one or two more hairs, not every day, every year, one or two more hairs, because you have androgens floating in your body, will be turned from a vellus to a terminal hair. And at some point, enough hair changes that you say, oh, I, I'm concerned about it. But two years ago, you had almost that many hairs, but just not enough. At some point, it clicks over. And you can't stop that because you're going to have androgens produced. It's just going to happen, and that's why women think, well, I went through menopause, and menopause caused me to grow a mustache. No, it's just that at about age 50, enough hairs turned from vellus to terminal that you noticed it. And menopause had nothing to do with it because the hairs are not sensitive to estrogen. They're sensitive to testosterone. And here's another thing that women don't, a lot, often don't understand. This is the growth cycle of hair. Hair grows when you're in the antigen phase. The little hair follicle is attached to the blood supply and it's growing. And how long you're in antigen determines how long your hair can be. If the average is you're in antigen about five years, each hair follicle. And so in five years, your hair can grow maybe this long. But some women are in antigen for nine years. Their hair can grow this long. Some women are in antigen only for three years. Their hair can only grow this long. Because once they move to the catagen, and this is where it's starting to, the blood vessel is starting to move away, and then the telogen phase, that's the resting phase. Once you move to resting, your hair's not growing anymore. So how long you're in this phase determines how long your hair can grow. And you can't change that. That's determined when you were born. Then, when it moves from telogen back to antigen, it's actually there's one more phase there. Right here, when it does this exogen phase, that's when the hair follicle is being pushed out by a new growing hair follicle. And that hair falls out. A new one is growing in, but that hair falls out. So anything that forces this growing phase 
this growing phase into the resting phase will at some point cause you to lose more hair because it, it, more hair will be it, normally about a hundred hairs a day are moving from telogen to exogen and start growing again but it turns out that these type of things will cause the hair to synchronize and force hair into that resting from growing to resting so this is very common we may have some women in the room who after they had their baby a month or two or three later said my hair started to fall out because that pregnancy forced growing hairs into that resting phase and then two or three or four months later they started growing again and that new hair pushed the old one out and so she's thinking oh my hair's falling out and truly it is falling out but it's falling out because a new one is growing from below psychological trauma thyroid disease these type things can cause it to synchronize and then when they go away new hairs will start to grow and it looks like your hair is falling out so the two things to take home from this is you can't force your hair to grow longer than the genetics is going to tell it to grow and number two if your hair is falling out all over after having one of these things don't sweat it it's going to grow back very different than male pattern baldness which is only on the temporal area on the top of the head and temp that's a separate issue if you start losing hair there that is something you need to go see the doctor this is global the whole head starts to become thin it is genetically determined when you start growing gray as you grow gray the hair follicle the little hair shaft it's not only not only does it start to turn gray but it becomes thinner each hair itself becomes thinner and a little more brittle so as your hair turns gray it's not just a color change there, you can actually measure it's a little bit thinner a little more brittle and the problem is the the uh, the melanin containing the the little parts the little cells around here that give color they're wearing out and dying and just not functioning anymore so they don't put the color infuse the melanin cover color into the hair and you can't change that either you can dye it though but you can't change when it comes women that's why you get those gray hairs that like stick out like this because there's no oil there either to keep it soft and pliable so all of those things or why you're like oh my gosh I have a whisker it you're not abnormal that's how it goes and oops I'm going the wrong way the last thing I want to show you is I do have to give credit. This is from shecares.com. Um, I don't know what that website says, but I liked how this gave you an overview of what the hormones do. So during the reproductive years, you can see, just like you explained, is that there's not a balance, but everything has to be coordinated and in sync. Otherwise, you don't have regular periods. Things start to happen in your body and hopefully gives you a whole new appreciation for the miraculous human body. And it helps you to understand when do we need to be looking for help or what you know can what can I watch a little bit longer and hopefully it gives you the whole picture do you remember the pictures I showed you at the beginning it gives you more of an appreciation for what affects what and how it, how things happen so in perimenopause you know 45 ish to 50 ish you still have lots of estrogen at first but then it kind of is waning and you can see the general trend is down but you still kind of get these ups and downs which is why Women have hot flashes or night sweats or vaginal dryness or maybe they don't sleep as well or they're a little bit more moody or whatever. And some women are obviously going to be more sensitive to that than others. Menopause is defined as no periods for a year. And we typically will expect to see some of these symptoms of the hot flashes or night sweats, that kind of stuff too. And then once we're postmenopausal, meaning, yeah, periods are done, you should not have any more vaginal bleeding. Those are things that you need to be going to the doctor for and then the estrogen kind of stays estrogen progesterone right because ovaries <laughs> and, and this encompasses estrogen. estrogen and then progesterone obviously is going to come down a little bit and the reason i brought the balloon people ask me this so plug plug your ears if you don't like big noises okay okay so even though i told you what was going to happen I even, I even shuddered. Sometimes this insult is very difficult for us. Some people get through it without 
too many problems. But my point is, you've had hormones functioning, kind of ruling, running your system for 40 years. So if it feels different to you, that's normal. Let's just figure out a way to help you feel more like yourself and to kind of get you through this stage. And the last thing is, if you find it helpful, we we're starting to create a series of videos on our website that might be very helpful, particularly for younger people, your you know, grandkids, or um, even your children who are trying to get pregnant. So we have a series about PCOS. What is it? What are some of the treatment options? What are the other health consequences that you need to be aware of? Many women, particularly younger girls, don't know what a pap smear is. So we have a, vi a video about what is a pap? Um, how do you know which websites are trustworthy? Uh, other things, healthy eating, particularly during the holiday season. So if there are things that you think would be helpful for us to kind of share and give information, then please let us know. But we want to work as part of your team to help you feel healthy and stronger. So well, thank, thank you, you for much. coming. Appreciate it.